Time for us to get started. It is that time. <laughs> I didn't say it. So on Thursday, uh, we went through Exodus 34, and we considered uh, some of the basic lessons of that chapter. Um, Moses has to go up on the mountain yet again with a second set of tablets um, to receive a second copy of the covenant. Um, and over our reading in Exodus 34, we see that the, the book of the covenant is kind of repeated in brief. And we get essentially the, the high points of the law, the key points of the law repeated for us. Um, so basically what's happened is Israel has, uh, they've broken the covenant, they've broken faith with God, and it's like they're having to go through it all over again um, to, uh, to get back into covenant with God. All right, so this, this demonstrates for us, by the way, I don't think we really talked about this on Thursday. This demonstrates a serious flaw uh, in the law of Moses, at least, uh, at least in human terms. Uh, we're the flaw, right? <laughs> That's, uh, we, I, I don't want to, to make it sound like the law of Moses is flawed. Uh, the flaw is us, right? That's, that's the, Hebrew pro, uh, the Hebrew writer's um, issue that he brings out with the law of Moses, that it is, ultimately, it's insufficient on a number of levels. Right? The Hebrew writer talks about um, how the, the blood of animals can't atone for sin, uh, talks about some other issues that actually are inherent in the law, but the biggest problem is the human factor. This covenant has barely been ratified you know, any time at all. Moses is still up on the mountain, and Israel has already broken the covenant. This agreement that is supposed to last between God and Israel, I mean, basically indefinitely. And Israel has broken it within, you know, the month and a half that Moses was up on the mountain uh, the, the first time. Um, so the covenant is reformed, and God here shows his mercy and his grace with Israel. I mean, we've seen his mercy in that he, he doesn't destroy the whole congregation and start over with Moses. Um, he only kills 3,000 of the congregation. He hits them with a plague. Um, he even, after Moses' intercession, agrees to continue to go with them. The, the, his presence will continue to be with Israel despite this grave sin that they have engaged in. Um, and so the fact that God is willing to essentially have a do-over with Israel it just demonstrates his great mercy and his grace toward them. Um, and we considered on Thursday uh, one, one aspect of the, the law that we had not seen earlier uh, was the way that they are to treat the, the pagan inhabitants of the land whenever they go into the land. All right, we're going to return to this idea for just a second because it's going to come up again. Uh, verse 11. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to, at, to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. Excuse me, so... Uh, the, the heathen are to be destroyed whenever they enter the promised land, specifically because the, their heathen neighbors are going to, uh, to invite them and motivate them to break faith with the Lord again. And obviously, how much help does Israel need with doing that? Right? I mean, they can manage that just fine on their own. They don't need other people encouraging them to do that. And so the rest of the law, basically, it sounds like a contrast between pagan worship and heathen worship. 
All right, so they have false feasts, false sacrifices to false gods. Israel is supposed to keep true feasts and offer true sacrifices to the true God. Now the chapter ends with this description of Moses' shining face. So Moses goes up on the mountain and being in the midst of the glory of God. And remember, we've seen... Uh, we saw at the very beginning of the chapter uh, where the Lord passes by Moses, you know, hides him in the cleft of the rock, and Moses is able to see his backside. Just being in that close proximity to the glory of the Lord leaves it to where Moses is shining. He's radiant. So whenever he comes down from the mountain, it's too intense for the sons of Israel to handle. Uh, and so what's he do while he's down in the camp among the sons of Israel? Yeah, he covers up. He puts on a veil to hide the Lord's glory. And again, it's not even, you know, it's not even Moses' glory. Right? This is secondhand glory that Israel is seeing. And it's too much for them to handle. So Moses wears a veil when he's in the camp. And then he takes the veil off when he's up on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. All right, so this is all important because we noted, uh, first off, one major o Old Testament parallel uh, between this story and another one. Uh, and that other story is Elijah uh, facing the, well, the aftermath of when Elijah faces down all the prophets of Baal. Um, and I, I want to tie something together that I don't think we had noted on Thursday. All right, remember, whenever God is telling Moses um, about these heathen nations, right, the warning is the, the snare that they will place in their midst is, uh, well, part of it is, you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods and make your sons whore after their gods. All right, so let's, we'll fast forward a bit to Elijah. Elijah has this great contest with the prophets of Baal, uh, and the God of Israel, of course, completely trounces Baal. Um, all the prophets of Baal are put to death. Why are there prophets of Baal in Israel to begin with? Who remembers? Who brought them in? There's one person who, more than anybody else, is responsible for bringing in Baal worship into Israel. It's Jezebel. All right, and Jezebel obviously is, well, whose wife is Jezebel? Ahab. Jezebel is not Israelite. She's a foreigner. This exactly this thing that Moses was talking about comes to pass in Ahab's case. Ahab marries out, right, and it, it is exactly this. You take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. So Ahab is remembered as one of the most wicked kings in Israel's history, and he didn't do it on his own. He had a lot of motivation and a lot of help in that, and Jezebel, uh, Jezebel is, uh, is the one who brings all of this in. She's the one that brings in all the Baal worship, uh, and Elijah has to confront that. Just as Moses had to confront uh, the kind of the, we might call it the proto Baal worship. Uh, as remember, Baal presents as a bull. And Israel here in Exodus 32 has been worshiping a calf. So Moses and Elijah have been engaged in the same struggle against idolatry. Uh, and there's this question again about who is the Lord, right? Is it. The, is it Adonai? Is it the God of Israel? Or is it Baal? You know, which again also means Lord. Um, and we look through all these parallels. Uh, so Elijah on his way to the mountain is fed by an angel twice. Uh, just as Israel is fed miraculously in the wilderness on their way to the mountain. Uh, Moses and Elijah both go up on the mountain. In fact, the exact same mountain. And they meet God there. Um, and what they do there is, it, it, it looks different on the surface. Right? So Moses is receiving the law, receiving the covenant. Um, Elijah is just going up there to hide. Right? But God's message for them is, is pretty similar. Right? That God is ultimately going to preserve those who are faithful to him. 
Right? That's his message of encouragement to Elijah, that he needs to keep serving because God has held back 7,000 of the sons of Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Right? A remnant will be saved. And that's essentially the same message for Israel, that there is a remnant that will be saved. Now, we know long run, how big is the, the remnant from the wilderness? How many of those who are wandering in the wilderness get to enter the promised land? Yeah, just two. <laughs> just Caleb and Joshua. Not even Moses himself gets to enter. The rest of them die, but it's a message of encouragement. Keep leading the people. <clears throat> Excuse me, in fact, that, that goes back to what Moses was saying. Uh, let's see. In what verse? Uh, in chapter 33, verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you've also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Right, so Moses and, and Elijah both, while they're up on the mountain, uh, they, they almost sound kind of hopeless. They, they, at least they sound desperate. Right, that Israel is just basically lost, um, and they don't know what to do about it. And God, meeting with them on the mountain, provides for both of them. Right, and of course, there's also the parallel of the 40 days and nights. Moses spends 40 days and nights up on the mountain. Elijah spends 40 days and nights traveling to the mountain. All right, so all of these important parallels between Moses and Elijah. Um, and then we finished up on Thursday by considering one parallel in the Gospels. Um, Jesus' time in the wilderness... Um, before he enters into his ministry. Forty days and nights without food. He is tempted by the devil. All right, but we noted this is, it's not a complete parallel. It just it cues us in right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that we're supposed to start drawing some connections between what Jesus is doing and what Moses has done and what Elijah has done. We're going to wrap up that parallel uh, in some of our considerations this morning. So let's, let's pray together, and we'll get into some material that we hadn't discussed yet. Let's pray. Righteous Father, thank you for the great gifts that you've given us today. Thank you for our time together to study from your word. And Father, I pray that as we study for, uh, about your people, study about your servants, uh, that we become more faithful in your service, Father. Thank you for the great gifts that you've given us in your Son. Thank you for, for, for fulfilling all things in him and forgiving us of our sins. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, turn to Luke chapter 9. I want us to wrap up this parallel. And basically, all of the stuff that we've discussed out of, you know, say, Exodus say 32 through 34 and 1 Kings 19, a lot of this is set up, right? It's, it's backstory for understanding what's going to happen in Luke 9. And I know it, it probably took a long time to do all of that setup, but consider it from Israel's perspective, right? Uh, they, the, their understanding of the setup took over a thousand years, so. I took about 15 minutes. Uh, Luke chapter 9. We'll start in verse 1. So I want us to see how Luke starts building some of these parallels for us. All right, we've already noted the parallel in Luke 3, the 40 days and 40 nights. Luke 9, And he called the twelve together, and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, nor bread, nor money. Do not have two tunics. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, 
Shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. All right, and already we, we get some subtle reminders of the Exodus wandering here. I mean, first off, there's an obvious correspondence between 12 apostles and 12 tribes. Right? That's, that's a correspondence that's made explicit in, uh, in Revelation 21, whenever John is describing the new Jerusalem. Remember, he describes the walls, and the walls have 12 gates with 12 foundations, and the 12 gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel, and the 12 foundations named after the 12 apostles. There's a correspondence between apostles and tribes. And they go out with very little. They go out poor. Uh, they go out wandering, proclaiming the kingdom of God, which is what Israel's on their way to make, is the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, you have the apostles wandering around. Verse 7, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. And Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Right here we get some reminders of Elijah's story. I mean, besides just the explicit mention of Elijah, you also have Herod, who is a foreign king. Verse 10, On their return the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we're here in a desolate place. And he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we were to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. And they did so, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces. And again, there we have that significant number twelve. And here we have a our first major, major parallel of the section, the miraculous feeding. Verse 18, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And here we have the beginnings of another major parallel. Because there's this, this explicit question. right? Who do people say that I am? Who do you understand me to be? And notice the answers that people are giving. It's you know, the answers that we saw Herod given. Some say it's John the Baptist. Some say it's Elijah. Some say one of the prophets of old has risen. Remember that Moses promises Israel that another prophet like him is going to arise from the people. This is a subtle reminder of Moses. These, the people are confused about who Jesus is. And among the people that they think he is, could be Elijah, could be one of the other prophets. Peter recognizes, or at least seems to recognize, who Jesus is. Peter answered, the Christ of God is the anointed one, the Messiah of God. Verse 21, he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. 
And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and James, uh, John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. All right, as we're reading along in the Transfiguration, hopefully a lot of these, these parallels back to Moses and Elijah are popping out at you. Because the Transfiguration is way, way more meaningful and way more important uh, than we sometimes treat it. Like, it, sometimes when we're reading through the Gospels, we can treat the Transfiguration as just kind of like a weird, interesting thing that happens, right? That you kind of wonder, like, well, what, are, what are the consequences of this, right? It seems like the really consequential stuff in the Gospels is... You know, the miraculous healings, the, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Like, we understand the consequences of those, right? If for the, the miracles, those obviously had some important consequences for the people who received those miracles. The crucifixion and the resurrection, we know that we receive our forgiveness and our hope of eternity through those. Right? But, like, what do you do with the transfiguration, Right, and if you don't have any sort of basis in the law or the prophets or in the history of Israel, the transfiguration just seemingly kind of comes out of the blue and doesn't make a whole lot of sense and doesn't seem all that important because we don't see Jesus like this again, right? Where the, his appearance is changed, his clothing becomes dazzling white. Uh, we, we don't see him portrayed this way again. Um, and we don't really see this brought up again until... Peter's epistles, uh, whenever Peter talks about this event. But if you understand Israel's history, if you understand the Law and the Prophets, this is super, super important. Because this is all taking place in pretty much exactly the same way as Israel going to the mountain, Elijah going to the mountain, Jesus takes Peter, John, and James up to the mountain. And throughout the scriptures, as we've seen, who do you meet on the mountain but God? Now, we said that Peter, earlier, seems to be the one who understands who Jesus is. All right, others say that he's John the Baptist, some say that he's Elijah, others say that he's one of the prophets of old. Peter gets it that he's the Christ of God. But what happens here shows that Peter only kind of gets it. And honestly, if, if one of us was in Peter's shoes, we probably wouldn't get it any better than he does. Right? Because you think of what happens with Moses up on the mountain. 
right? He, he meets with God, and he comes down, and his appearance is changed. He's radiant. He's dazzling. People can't stand to look at him. He has to put a veil on. And here on the mountain, Jesus' appearance is changed, and his clothing becomes dazzling white. And then, of course, who should they meet up on the mountain but Moses and Elijah, the two men who have met God up on the mountain in this way. And so Moses and Elijah and Jesus are there, and Moses and Elijah appear in glory. Jesus appears in glory. So if you're Peter, what do you think this means? I mean, you can see what Peter thinks. Uh, what, what does he think about Jesus in comparison to Moses and Elijah? He kind of thinks they're like all on the same plane. Right? Peter gets this connection, by the way, uh, between what's happening to them right there on the mountain and this meeting with God in, you know, in Exodus and Elijah's meeting with God in 1 Kings 19. And so Peter proposes that they build three tents, that is, three tabernacles. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Again, Peter does not completely get it. He thinks that Jesus uh, has become dazzling in the same way that Moses has, that he's reflecting God's glory. What Peter hasn't figured out is that meeting God on the mountain does not mean that you know, he and John and James and Jesus go up on the mountain and the four of them together meet God up on the mountain. It's the three of them, Peter, John, and James, go up on the mountain and they realize they've been traveling with God this whole time. Jesus is not reflecting God's glory. He's, he has it. He's radiating it from himself. Right? The, the disciples are not seeing a reflection. They're not seeing secondhand glory. They are seeing God's glory. And that is revealed to them, starting in verse 34. As Peter was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. Again, just like we've seen with Moses, just like we've seen with Elijah. The cloud of the Father comes and settles on the mountain. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Again, just as Israel was terrified. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. All right, and so this question really get settled for Peter. Well, and hopefully for John and James as well. Um, it really gets settled for them. Because Jesus is not on the same level, not on the same plane as Moses and Elijah. What he's doing is a fulfillment of what they have done. Right? But he is superior to them. As the voice from the cloud declares, This is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And afterwards, Moses and Elijah are gone. And it's only Jesus who's left. All right, so this, and this tells us a lot, by the way, about Jesus' ministry. All right, that like Moses, he is there to, uh, to ratify a new covenant. All right, like Moses and Elijah, Jesus is there to combat idolatry and to bring the people of Israel to true worship. You, know, you think, um, you go back to, to Exodus 32 and you go back to you know, 1 Kings 18, and you think Israel has bigger problems in those days. Right? They're worshiping a golden calf, they're worshiping Baal, and by Jesus' day, it doesn't look all that bad. In fact, if anything, Israel in that time was really well known for not worshiping idols. Uh, and yet, and we've seen this through the Gospels that we've studied, that um, the people of Israel 
are more deeply implicated in their idolatry than they understand. All right, and Jesus is there to combat that. Jesus is there to tear down the idols. Jesus is there to guide the remnant into salvation. Right, that God has preserved people for himself who will worship in truth. All right, so the transfiguration is super, super important. Uh, and I really think this is, this is one of the coolest things in the Gospels. You think about how much has to get built up for the transfiguration to make sense. Right? That Moses is coming out, you know, like 13, 1400 years before this and laying the groundwork for it. And Elijah you know, is coming out, um, you know, a good, oh, what years did he live? I want to say around 800 years, maybe less, maybe more. Um, before Jesus in laying the groundwork for this. This is like, yeah, th this is a story that's been a long time in the telling that is accomplished right here. It's not just some throwaway thing. All right, any questions or comments on the, the transfiguration before we continue? Uh huh. I've, I've considered that. I'm, not, I'm really not sure what to think of it. It's definitely in the realm of possibility. Um, all right, but, and you also see how Luke kind of builds all of this stuff up. Like we've, we've gotten all of these things together. Uh, you know, you've got the 40 days and 40 nights first. You've got the miraculous feeding. You've got going up on the mountain. Um, you've got, I mean, you've, you've got wandering in the wilderness. All right, and it ultimately all comes down to this question is, uh, of who are we going to serve and how are we going to serve him? Mm -hmm. That last question, he didn't bring it out, but I believe it's kind of like what we do now. Uh-huh. We don't uh, worship idols and build our stone. Right. But we do worship an idol and call ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's... Yes. Yeah, Jesus is constantly calling them out uh, for this kind of false belief. And Jesus warns us against it. All right, so the lesson, whenever we go back and we read you know, Israel uh, in Exodus 32 or 1 Kings 18, or we read the Pharisees in the Gospels, the lesson is not, oh, how superior we are to them. The lesson is, we better watch out so we don't do that. Right? Even though none of us have, you know, I don't, I don't think any of us have ever been to church and, you know, one of the elders asked, you know, all right, everybody, ladies, take off your earrings. I've got the smelter here. Uh, right? It, no, nobody does that. Um, but the risk of idolatry is still extremely high. All right. So let's return to Exodus. Here in the last bit of our class, I want us to wrap the book up because we've got, so chapters 35 through 39 all concern uh, the, the making of the tabernacle and everything that goes in it, including the priestly garments. And it brings us up to chapter 40, the final chapter of the book where everything is done, right? This is, this is essentially the climax of the book. All right, sometimes we think of the Red Sea crossing as the climax of the Exodus story. It's not. All right, this is the moment that the whole story's been building up to. The plagues, the crossing, all of that is subservient to what we read here. 
Exodus chapter 40, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And I tell you, before we... I almost forgot to do this. Um, let me pass these out real quick. We're not going to spend really any time studying the construction of the tabernacle. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got a couple here. So... Uh, what Dean is passing out uh, comes from this book. It's called The Craigle Pictorial Guide to the Temple. Um, and it gives a little diagram of you know, the way the tabernacle is laid out. It, we just recently went through this text in the Bible meetup. And let me, let me make a confession. Reading through the sections of Exodus about the tabernacle... I think I have kind of the same reaction that a lot of people have whenever they're reading the genealogies in Scripture. Like, my eyes just cross. Um, and I don't know if, if that works the same way for y'all whenever, whenever you read through those descriptions. We've got lots and lots of text laying out lots of really specific details about the, uh, the making and the construction of the tabernacle. And it's easy to get bogged down in that. Um, thank you, Dean. So, what this is, is just kind of the, a snapshot of the tabernacle. All right, so in the upper right-hand corner, uh, you've got that plan of the tabernacle, and it just lays everything out. Um, so, as we're reading through Exodus 40 here, this is going to summarize everything that we have passed over in Exodus 35 through 39. All right, we're, getting to, we're getting to see the end result of all of the construction excuse me, that has happened. And so, you can refer to this plan as we're reading through. On the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And you shall put in it the Ark of the Testimony, and you shall screen the Ark with the veil. And you shall bring in the table and arrange it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. And you shall put the golden altar for incense before the Ark of the Testimony, and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. All right, so you see in, uh, in section 1 there on the plan, it, they've, they have marked the altar of incense, number 4, but for some reason, they did not mark uh, the table for the showbread, and they did not mark the lampstand. Um, those would be the, the two other boxes that are there next to number four. So you've got the altar of incense, the lampstand, and the table for the showbread. And that's all in the holy place, which only the priests get to go into. Let's see. Um, verse 6. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. All right, so you see numbers 5 and 7. Number 7 is the altar of sacrifice. It's out in the courtyard. Uh, number 5 is the, the basin with the water in it in between the tabernacle and the altar. Let's see. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. All right, so that's the outer wall that you see in the diagram. You shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand, and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and wash them with water. And put on Aaron the holy garments, and you shall anoint him and consecrate him, that he may serve me as priest. You shall bring his sons also, and put coats on them, and anoint them, as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests." And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. All right, this is kind of the key statement in the chapter. This is the pivot of the chapter. This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. 
And from here out, I want, to, I want you to notice there's going to be a, a phrase that is repeated over and over uh, through the rest of the chapter. So pay attention as we read. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames, put in its poles, and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark, and put the poles on the ark, and set the mercy seat above, the, on, the, uh, above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the screen, and screened the ark of the testimony, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting, on the north side of the tabernacle, outside the veil, and arranged the bread on it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting, opposite the table, on the south side of the tabernacle, and set up the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil, and burned fragrant incense on it, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put in place the screen for the door of the tabernacle, and he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting, and when they approached the altar, they washed, as the Lord commanded Moses." And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar, and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. All right, so did you catch what phrase gets repeated over and over in that part of the text? Just as, the Lord. as the Lord had commanded Moses, at literally each and every step of putting this thing together. Moses does it as the Lord had commanded Moses. Right? That's, that's the whole point of this section. This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. All right, this, this is ideal obedience. God lays out the pattern, and Moses follows it. And here's the result. Verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. All right, and that's the end of that part of the story. And this is a spectacular thing that has just happened. Because up to this point, where have we seen the cloud of the Lord's glory? So, yeah, so it followed them in the desert, and we've seen it most recently, and notably, on the mountain. And how much, Israel, or how much access does Israel have to that? Absolutely none. You can't even touch the edge of the mountain or you're to be put to death. Now, the cloud of the Lord's glory... All right, because Moses has built this tabernacle and done it all according to the pattern of the Lord, as the Lord commanded him, now the cloud of the Lord's glory settles into the tabernacle in the midst of the, of the congregation of Israel. All right, there's still a lot of separation between Israel and the glory of the Lord, but not nearly as much. Uh, it's not, don't even touch the edge of the mountain or you die. Because Israel, at least, uh, can bring their offerings to the courtyard and be very, very close to the presence of the Lord compared to when the Lord's presence was up on the mountain. They can bring offerings and stand more or less in the presence of God. And so the mountain, as it were, has now begun to travel with Israel. Right? They had to go to the mountain to see the presence of the Lord. But now the presence of the Lord is going to travel with them in this tent. All right, so that's it for Exodus. 
uh, we're going to we're going to jump into some of the uh, the narrative sections of Leviticus from here out. Uh, there's not a whole lot in Leviticus. There's more in Numbers and more in Deuteronomy um, to you know, finish up the story of Israel's wandering in the wilderness and their receiving of the law uh, and whether or not they live up to this covenant that God has given them. So thank you so much for your, uh, your questions, your comments, and your kind attention this morning.